Hey guys, Captain here, and today I'm bringing you a Pokemon card video, and it's how to build a deck. This is like the fundamentals of it, but I am going to try and do the best job I can here. Now, first, I want to talk about theme decks. Now, why do I want to talk about theme decks? What even are theme decks? Theme decks are bad. They're pretty much awful. They cost like 10 or $12, uh, somewhere from that range. Um... And they're usually not even worth the money, unless you're literally, like, brand new to the game and need a deck just to learn how to play. Uh, the only other good thing about them is, one, occasionally they'll have some decent cards in them. And, uh, they're also good for getting lots of energy cards. But, um, those are cheap online anyway. So, theme decks, the reason they're bad is because they're constructed poorly. Now, there are a couple things about this, and, um... First off, I noticed that a lot of people, when they're making their first decks or making decks overall, they tend to build them similarly to theme decks. And this is bad, because if you ever bring this to a tournament or anything competitive, you'll get wrecked. Um, because, frankly put, it's just lacking the fundamentals of deck building. Even if you use really good cards, if you build in the style of theme, in the style of theme decks, you'll still do poorly. Like I said, even with good cards. So what theme decks like to do is they'll almost always have two types. This already is a wrong approach. Now what this means, they basically, theme decks, they make two theme decks, um, sometimes three, but usually two for every single new set they release. And so what they do is they'll toss in two types and just a couple Pokemon from the set um, of those types to fit that. And then, you know, they'll have a decent amount of energy and whatnot. But this is bad because it means the deck lacks a strategy. There's really, there's nothing, like, good for the deck in there. It's just, it's just Pokemon. That's all it is together, you know? Um, there's no strategy. You need a strategy. Now, some of the top-tier decks um, out there will run just one type of Pokemon. Some will run several types of Pokemon. It doesn't matter as long as you can use them and they're helpful. A lot of Pokemon that are used in top-tier decks will never, ever even uh, get a chance to attack in the active spot. Except with, you know, the odd exception when you're literally forced to. But, but normally, in a normal situation, they would never, ever be active and attacking. Um, because they're just there for support to help the strategy. A really simple one I could explain. Um, one deck, it's kind of dropping out of popularity a bit. But um, Reshiram... Or not really popularity, but power. Reshiram Typhlosion um, or Reshiram Embor both work really similarly. The strategy behind that there is that um, Reshiram discards two fire energy whenever it attacks. Now Typhlosion can take one fire energy from the discard pile and reattach it to a Pokemon with the penalty of one damage counter. Embor can attach as many fire energy per turn um, as it wants to um, any Pokemon like um, from the hand. Sorry, I kind of stopped thinking there for a second. But um, what this essentially means is that while normally if you're attaching the one energy card per turn as the rule state, It'll take you two turns every time to use this attack. And this attack does 120 damage. This is a lot of damage. Um, what Typhlosion or Embor allow you to do is use this attack every single turn. And that's what the strategy of the deck is. It's basically just set up and then deal damage consistently and quickly over and over. And it's been pretty successful because uh, right now 120 and 130 are kind of magic numbers. 120 is an amount of damage that a lot of Pokemon... Not a lot, but several Pokemon can achieve. And um, 130 is the amount of hit points that a lot of Pokemon happen to have. Um, so, anyway, as you can see, it's, it's better than just some fire Pokemon tossed together that don't really help each other in any way. The Embor or the Typhlosion there... Typhlosion will sometimes be attacking, but usually the Embor and Typhlosion will be sitting on the bench acting as support. Um... There would also be Ninetales variants, and those would be purely support, because all you use them for is to draw a lot of cards. Now, that actually brings me to another point with theme decks. 
theme decks tend to have really crummy proportions of like trainers and uh, to uh, Pokemon to energy. Theme decks, I don't know. It's something like 25 Pokemon. I don't know. They they use. And now that I think they've actually gotten better, it's like 18 energy, maybe like a dozen or 15 trainers, and then the rest Pokemon. You know, whatever Pokemon. But um, that's pretty bad because the trainers and supporters and sometimes stadiums are basically what's going to be making your deck work. And um, actually, if you look at the popular decks right now, almost all of them use a certain amount of, like, the same cards in them. And I'll get to that later. Those are what uh, we'll, we call staple cards. Like I said, I'll discuss that in another section of the video. But um, the decks usually lack the power of, of draw power because you want to be consistently either getting more cards or getting new cards. So that if you ever have a dead hand, you you know you want more better cards. You don't want to have to rely on your top decks, which is the card you draw every single turn, to uh, get you places. That's way too slow. Uh, you need to in competitive level Pokemon. You need to get things done. You need to get things done consistently and fast. Um, and theme decks often lack that. They also tend to lack search to set up consistently. And if you ever try playing a theme deck, you'll notice you're setting up like different Pokemon as your main attacker like pretty much every single time. You're trying to get a certain one out, but you're setting up different ones. Speaking of trying to get a certain one out, another thing theme decks are infamous for are pyramid lines. So at the bottom, they'll have... By the way, they've actually gotten better about this. At the bottom, they'll have the basic Pokemon, usually four of it. The theme decks generally tend to be centered around, like, one Pokemon or whatever, and then just other Pokemon of types thrown in. But of, like, the main line, it'll usually be four at the bottom. And it used to go two and then one at the top, and now it's gotten better. And I've noticed some do four, three, two. But this is bad, and it might seem like it makes sense, right? Because some of, uh, you want a lot of the basics, and then you'll kind of go up the pyramid. But really, this is bad, because um, what happens instead is, let's say you get that single or those two of the stage two finally out. Not only is it harder to get them, because in the case that you don't have search power, you're basically relying on drawing into them, which is going to be tougher, because there's less of them. But when they get knocked out, Suddenly, this other one of the stage one and the other two basics, they're worthless. And they're just, they're just clogging up space in your hand or whatever, or on your bench. And you don't want that. Popular lines, stage twos aren't as good anymore. But um, when stage twos are used, people use something more like hourglass shaped kind of. And you'll see stuff like... Four three four, uh, even four two four, uh, three one three, three two three, and so on. The reason for this is because people usually include a card that can help you skip over the middle one. Sometimes with dot, um, with trainer lock decks, people will have to rely on something more like three two two, or even two two two. People usually go with three two two. I'll explain that later. There's a lot of intricacies in this, but. Generally speaking, stage 2 decks are going to be using something like this. Um, meanwhile, for the other counts of things in the, the decks, you know, Pokemon is as many Pokemon as you need, that's fine. But as long as you've got a good engine of trainers and you've got enough energy. But you only need enough, you know? Maybe, like, a little extra, but if you don't want to have too much energy because that clogs up your hand and it's useless. You can only attach one per turn, keep that in mind. Theme decks used to have something like 25 or 24 energy, I remember. Um, now, I guess they're, they're down to 18, which is a big improvement. But most competitive level decks, you'll notice, go somewhere between 10 to 15, depending on how much they use. Um, of course, it depends. Some decks that use very, very minimal energy will have something like 9 or 10. Some that require lots and lots of energy might be uh, even over 15, but that's pretty rare. Anyway, I guess that's about it for theme decks. Now, 
I think the next best thing to talk about would be staple cards. Right then, staples. So what are staples? I briefly explained earlier that there are cards that are used in pretty much every single deck. Now these are going to vary from format to format, so I'm not going to be super specific with examples. I'll give a few, but um, I'm not going to be super specific because as soon as the rotation happens, th this section of the video, if I were that specific, would kind of be out of date. But um, I should mention the current rotation is referred to as HS on. And what this means is that all the sets starting with Heart Gold Soul Silver and uh, all the sets newer than that so basically all the Heart Gold Soul Silver sets, Call of Legends, and all of like the the black and white sets, you know, emer you've got black and white, emerging powers, noble victories, and soon to be next destinies, and so on. All those sets are legal currently. So right now, I think we're at eight sets right now. Yeah. There's about a hundred cards per set. So it might sound like that's, you know, a lot of cards to choose from. Really, there are only so many viable cards per set, and then some others get tossed in because, you know, say, like, they're the basic form of, like, a powerful Stage 2 attacker, Stage 1. Um, but anyway, there are... Staple cards tend to be supporters and uh, trainers. And uh, they're usually... They're staples because they're very useful. Now, one example I will name is uh, Pokemon Collector. What it lets you do is it's a supporter that lets you find three basics from your deck and uh, put them in your hand, which is really good because that's the foundation of your setup, those basic, those first few basic Pokemon, to set up whatever support Pokemon you need, maybe you're a, for your attacker, or maybe your attacker is a basic Pokemon. Um, so for that reason, Pokemon Collector is a really good card, and a lot of decks will run three or four of them. You'll notice sometimes with staples they consequently tend to be a little bit expensive. Um, other decks, or other staples, are for draw power. One we have right now is called Professor Oak's New Theory, and it lets you take your hand, shuffle it into your deck, and draw six brand new cards. Some of them might be the cards you just shuffled in, but hopefully they won't be. So it gets you a new hand, which is going to be good for uh, when your current hand is useless, or if you really need to try and draw into a certain card. Um, and so decks will often run uh, a lot of draw power. Since we don't have too many good draw support Pokemon, right now most decks will run somewhere like 7, 8, maybe even more draw supporters. Um, one that kind of keeps showing up, we've had it in several formats in the past, and the current card text is the same as Pokemon Breeder, which was from the base set, actually, way back uh, at the start of Pokemon trading card game. It's called Rare Candy, and it basically lets you skip from the basic Pokemon to the Stage 2 Pokemon, um, given that the basic Pokemon has been in play for at least one turn. And so this is really good because it helps speed up Stage 2 decks, so any deck that runs Stage 2 will usually run a few more of those. Like I said, I'm not going to try and get too specific with more examples, but you just kind of got to look through the cards and realize what might be good. Also, if you browse through forums and whatnot, and you look at what cards are consistently showing up in people's decks, um, then that might be a good way of figuring out what the current staples are. Alright then, now finally onto the actual deck building process. So, one, you want to start with an idea, and like I said, theme decks usually pick like two types, but you're going to want to start with either a Pokemon or a strategy. Maybe it's your favorite Pokemon, you want to base a deck around that. Or maybe it's a, a strategy, you see a combo between two or three cards, and you realize this could be uh, powerful and have potential. Maybe you read about uh, another deck using the same strategy online, you want to build one of those. But somewhere or another, you want to pick the type of your deck. Also, uh, in Pokemon, there are a lot of what are called archetypes, or maybe it's archetype, I don't know the pronunciation. But anyway, it's basically, people will, let's say you go to like a tournament, and there's maybe 50 people there. But let's say 10 of them are running very, very similar decks. The decks are based around the same exact strategy. And these archetypes will usually have names. I named, I mentioned one earlier, it was Typhlosion Reshiram. People usually call that Tyram. Because people usually just mash together the names in it. But um, it's, people will build their own variations on it, but it has the same core fundamental strategy because the strategy has proven itself to be powerful and uh, to work, you know, to be effective. But anyway, you want to pick 
strategy or type of deck, whatever, however you're going to start. You need something to start. And then you want to kind of add to that. You're going to want to draft a skeleton. What a skeleton is, is it's a list of like 40 to 55 cards or so for uh, your deck to work. Now, decks have to be exactly 60 cards, no more, no less. But honestly, most of the time, you're probably not going to have spare room. Like when you, the more you look, if it feels like you have a lot of room, you're going to look at it and be like, oh, maybe I could toss some of this in and this in and this in. The next thing you know, you're out of room. Um, but you basically just pick the core cards you need to make your deck work. So uh, maybe let's go with our Tyram example before. Let's try, let's try four Reshiram. And maybe let's try a 4 2 4 Typhlosion. Typhlosion Prime, that is. Um, and then we'll need our usual list of staples. Let's go with 4 Pokemon Collector. Maybe 4 po Professor Oak's New Theory. And so on. And uh, you'll, you'll draft your skeleton of what you need to make your deck work. And then you're going to need to fill in the blanks. You can do some testing with your skeleton right away for consistency to see if it works. But personally, I like to fill in the blanks and, and then test other things with the deck. Um, at the very least, I can fill in the blanks without tossing in kind of gimmicky stuff. Or maybe if you're gonna, if you're gonna start testing for consistency, I'd say try and get up to a kind of a high number of cards, like 55 plus. Um, because otherwise it'll skew the odds of you drawing into certain things or starting with certain things. But somewhere or another, you can, you can do some testing here to make sure it's consistent enough. Maybe if you have too much trouble setting up something, you might want to adjust your little list and you'll fill in the blanks for uh, things to either improve problems that you might have found in early testing if you did that, or to improve, say, other matchups. If, um, if there's a certain matchup that gives your deck a really hard time, you might want to put in what's called a tech. And a tech is basically just a counter or a solution to that. For example, um, for a while, the Zekrom deck, which was Zekrom, Pachirisu, Shaman, uh, Zekrom could have a lot of trouble against Donphan. When Tornadus came out, uh, Tornadus became instantly a staple in Zekrom decks because Tornadus um, not only could kind of deal with Donphan in, I think, two hits. That sounds about right. And, uh, but also, it had a resistance to Don Fan's fighting attacks, which was really good because it, otherwise Zekroms would get uh, just steamrolled by Don Fan. So you do that, fill in the blanks to improve consistently, consistency or matchups, or, uh, you know, sometimes people will put in a kind of surprise effect cards. There was uh, an article on Six Prizes a few months back where I think it was Kenny Wisdom and a couple friends all went to regionals or something like that with Dialga Chomp, which was a pretty well-established archetype at the time. But they all put in Lost Remover, kind of as a surprise card. And it proved to be surprisingly effective. I, I think like three or four of them made top cut and placed really well uh, with the deck. So sometimes that's something to keep in mind too. Then you want to do testing. There's two types of testing. Um... The first one is solitaire testing, and this you can do alone. This is great for testing consistency. Basically, you just take your deck, and you go through a couple of imaginary turns, um, either without an opponent or with an imaginary opponent, and um, you, you basically see if you can successfully set up whatever you need um, in a reasonable amount of time. And usually, to be fully set up, usually it's good to be turn three or sooner. Because uh, this tends to be a pretty speedy format, where a lot of times it comes down to people trying to get a prize every single turn, if possible. Um, so you're going to do some solitude testing for consistency, which is also great with your uh, skeleton early on. And then there's uh, testing against other decks, uh, particularly kind of generic decks of um, other matchups. And it's good to test against all sorts of decks, including the Mirror, which is the very same deck you're playing, or the same archetype, basically. Um, if possible, it's good to test 10 games against each deck to see 
um, what the matchup is like. And maybe if you notice a certain matchup is surprisingly bad, you can kind of go back to the fill in the blank stage, swap them something out and try and improve that matchup with the tech or something or, uh, along those lines. Um, so th at this point, you've got a deck and it basically just becomes more of testing and improving and so on. Um, until you try and get the best deck you possibly can. Now, if you can find friends who are interested or uh, other serious players, like sometimes people will kind of have like a team and they'll usually exchange strategies with each other. Sometimes they'll go to tournaments with the exact same deck and try and uh, do well together, like what uh, Kenny Wisdom did. I think that was who did that anyway. Um, but that's beside the point. If you can find people, that's great. If you can find a league near you, somewhere on Pokemon's website, you can, uh, there's like a league finder. And at league, um, you know, you can play lots of games there. And it's not as competitive an atmosphere. Sometimes people build what are so-called league decks, which is like a deck that has the fundamentals. Like usually, usually they'll have the fundamentals and staple cards to be good. But it's kind of a gimmicky strategy. It's more of like a for fun deck. Like I'm not gonna expect this to win any tournaments and uh but anyway leagues tends to be a great way to test if you can find one uh i suppose that's about it for that really um i should mention one thing if you've got friends who are just trying to get back into the game it might be good to have like a theme deck style deck like not as bad as a theme deck but you know, not as good as competitive. Like, a league deck would be great, actually, or something a little below that level. Like, maybe, e like, ease up on your, um, uh, new friend, just so you don't get crushed every time, because you don't want to discourage them. But then teach them, you know, the good fundamentals of deck building. Um, and that's why I keep some of the not-so-good decks I have, like the one I demonstrated last video, um, that I was using. I just keep that for playing with friends who don't really have competitive decks. I think that's about it, though. Um, that's all I can really think of. I see posts a lot on forums that I browse on, uh, you know, decks that are kind of missing the fundamentals of construction. So that's one of the things that inspired me to make this. I've been wanting to do something like this for a while, actually. But uh, I suppose that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you liked it, please rate, comment, subscribe. Especially send this to your friends if they want to learn how to build a deck, because... Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning of the video, but I checked Google, and from the first page of results, like, half of them are terrible. Um, but I guess that's about it, then. I'll see you guys next time. I think I'll make kind of a shorter Pokemon video, but about some good resources, uh, particularly online resources, for uh, Pokemon enthusiasts.